first treatise was a story about the origin of the moral way of valuing, the moral way of determining what's good. And the account that Nietzsche gives shows how the moral way of valuing, of identifying what's good, comes from, emerges from um, a reaction to a pre-moral or noble way of valuing. Um, and this account of the emergence of a moral way of determining what's good, the moral use of the word good, um, begins to put us in a position where we can evaluate the moral system of values to see whether we should endorse it, to see what parts of it we should endorse perhaps, or at least at a minimum, it puts us in a position to see more clearly what alternatives there might be. And then we can think about the strengths and weaknesses of different forms of value. Okay, in the second treatise, we're going to get a kind of parallel story about the origins and development of the moral understanding of right actions. So in the first treatise, we got a story about the development of the moral way of thinking about understanding good. In the second treatise, we're going to get a parallel story about the emergence of the moral understanding of right actions and the idea of duty. Um, so we're going to get a story here that traces back the moral understanding of duty and obligation back to a pre-moral understanding of the ideas of duty and um, obligation. And along the way we're going to get, um, I think, a clearer picture of how it was that the moral system of evaluation accomplished something that Nietzsche thinks is genuinely of value. How it made us, as he said back in the first treatise, interesting and gave us depth. Okay, so the second treatise is called uh, Guilt bad conscience and related matters. So guilt here in German is schuld. Uh, bad conscience is schlechtes gewissen. Um, and related matters. These are the main two ideas. Okay, and he starts by saying, to breed an animal that is permitted to promise. Isn't this precisely the paradoxical task that nature has set for itself with regard to man. Isn't this the true problem of man, he says. Then he says that this problem has been solved to a high degree, must appear all the more amazing for reasons that we're going to talk about. So this problem of creating an animal that's permitted or has a right to make promises, um, this is amazingly something that Nietzsche thinks has largely been accomplished. That is, most of us are permitted, that is, have a right to make promises. Okay, so who's permitted to make promises? What's the idea of being entitled to or having a right to make promises. What do you think? Yeah, what does it mean to, he says, be permitted to promise? So I'll give you a hint. It's not like a legal status. And it's just we get to carry a social contract with each other, right? Um, so making a promise is sort of maybe one half of a kind of Commitment, that's right. So there's a kind of analog to a contract. Your contract usually will be in two directions. Um, but what's required in order for that to be legitimate, in order for that to be something we are entitled to do, that we're, so to speak, permitted to do? I'll give you another hint. It's not somebody else giving us permission, right? So Nietzsche is here talking about what it takes to be able to legitimately make a promise. It's going to come to that, yeah. So um, this is what's going to emerge. But what's the sense of right and wrong going to do for you? 
most of us, most of the time. It's amazing that we've done this to one who can fully appreciate the force working in opposition, namely that of forgetfulness. So what we have to overcome in order to be permitted to make promises is this idea of forgetfulness. And furthermore, forgetfulness, he says, is an active, I'm still in the first paragraph here, forgetfulness is an active and in the strictest sense positive faculty of suppression. And so forgetfulness isn't just something that passively happens as we move on and things drift away. Rather, it's an active pushing away. Um, he says, so line 12 there, he says, to temporarily close, so this is like, yeah, the active force of forgetfulness, to temporarily close the doors and windows of consciousness, to remain undisturbed by the noise and struggle with which our underworld of subservient organs works for and against each other. A little stillness, a little tabula rasa of consciousness, so that there is again space for new things. Above all, for the nobler functions and functionality. So forgetfulness is necessary in order to push things away, in order to clear space in our, in our consciousness, so to speak, um, so that we can introduce these as nobler functions and functionaries for ruling, for seeing, predetermining, for our organism is set up oligarchically. That is, the use of this active forgetfulness, a doorkeeper, as it were, an upholder of psychic order, of rest, of etiquette, from which one can immediately anticipate the degree to which there could be no happiness, no cheerfulness, no hope, no pride, no present, like, like living as, like living in the moment, without forgetfulness. Okay, so um, the active psychic force of of pushing away what is in our thoughts, um, he says, is a necessary requirement for the introduction of nobler functions, higher values. It's necessary for happiness, cheerfulness, hope, pride, and being able to respond in the present. What the heck's he talking about? Any thoughts about this? Kind of like you have to clear your mind to make more space for new things. That's for true. Things. That's exactly right. But what are you clearing your mind? Of? Is that plausible? I think definitely it is plausible because it is possible to suppress a thought that is kind of overtaking. You know, Excellent. What kinds of thoughts tend to overtake? And we've seen the kinds of thoughts that he's especially worried about in the first place. What kinds of thoughts are there which stay with us? Emotionally driven. Yeah, emotionally driven, but a specific kind of emotion that he's talking about. Like, like resentment. Yeah. Resentment. Right. Okay, so resentment, you remember, was the moralization of suffering. Okay, and this is something that off that for the moral system of values clings to us and poisons our thought. So this is easiest to see. So this active forgetfulness, I think, is easiest to think about in the case of pain. So you can think about physical pain that can come to dominate your life and you have to be able to put it aside. But really, you should be thinking especially of emotional pain. Um, where if you allow that hurt, that emotional pain to cling to you, it'll come to dominate you. And what Nietzsche's talking about here is the ability to get over, the ability to actively forget those hurts, actively forget those kinds of emotional pains, put them behind us, and move on to accomplish things, to
to get over it so that we